as basic as the talk would be that has been given to me it's equally controversial i would say and that's where it comes in when you say guidelines versus practice that says it all so i'll take through <clears throat> through a few slides where i hope i can convey the message right by the end of the talk so if you look at the incidence of urolithiasis now i'm not going to take numbers here but then it's all over the world but we in india are sitting bang in the center of it and i'm sure many other regions are also having the same incidences but if i have to look at uh, the agenda of today's talk i would split into uh, these headings where i'll start with a brief introduction then i'll take you through the evolution of met the literature and how met is going to play a role in pediatric age group in pregnancy then a brief note on guidelines and the current trends in practice to compare with guidelines and then i'll conclude with a nutshell in a slide to introduce i mean urolithiasis is something which we see day in and out it's got a risk factor of say around 5 to 10% and the recurrence rate is is quite high 50% that is the reason why you keep seeing your patients again and again and the lifestyle disorders in these days were like obesity diabetes and metabolic syndrome kind of diseases are not helping our cause the incidence is going growing by the day and of course we have multiple modalities to deal with stone diseases and uh, uh, one of them is of course medical expulsion of therapy which is kind of offshoot these days and the choice of intervention predominantly depends on the patient surgeon anatomy and the stone characteristics of course that holds good for any any of these modalities we look at but as a part of introduction i would like to make another three statements here it's by and large in majority of the articles you see that if there's no active treatment indicated in these patients met is indicated okay that's drugs and used and to avoid a surgery and it's not only a primary therapy it is also used as an auxiliary therapy after a procedure like esw or ursl and the con with the controversy is all around purely because of the contradictory results from trials and meta analysis of all the data you could find both of high quality and that's where the controversy sets in but whatever said and done it's an excellent choice why it decreases the colic events the knockout use goes down the hospital visits come down the treatment costs go down and the chances of surgery is slim if met is effective of course it's an excellent choice why wouldn't the patient say no to it and if i look at the evolution of how it all started at the primary way of giving increased fluid it could be in terms of oral or even iv fluids in some instances antiemetics and analgesics were a supportive form of therapy to this and then the whole scenario changed the moment we characterized the adrenergic receptors and the smooth muscle physiology the more we understood this the more we got uh into the expertise level of using our drugs then started the targeted medical treatment in terms of antagonists to adrenergic receptors and then blockers of calcium channels there are a few other drugs which we normally consider in this to put it in a gist these are around six drugs if i would like to say uh mostly seen in our literature the first one being the most common and the most effective as per a few uh, uh data we go through is alpha blockers and to briefly cut short on the physiology part yeah that's where it acts on the alpha 1 blockers there by the norepinephrine norepinephrine doesn't have an action and the increased ip3 protracted pathway is cut short and the contraction is prevented there by relaxing the smooth muscle that's a simple physiology we've been learning and the calcium channel inhibitors one step ahead and they act on the actin myosin complex and thereby helping the relaxation of the muscles and pe5 inhibitors is another drug of choice which 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 was used or which has been used wherein the pd5 inhibits the conversion of cgmp into the gmp cyclin guanosine monophosphate and thereby increasing the levels of cgmp and helps in relaxation and uh, the other uh, uh, drugs uh, sorry uh, here would be corticosteroids which has been contemplated and said that the uh, edema is uh, reduced using these and thereby helping the stones to fall off Mirabiclon is another molecule which has been recently considered as a beta 3 adrenoreceptor, which helps in uh, MET again. And bromelain is a COX-2 and a PGE2 inhibitor, which is mostly seen in uh, the stem and leaves of pineapple, and it's got anti-inflammatory action and thereby uh, giving it a, a, a property in good enough to use in MET. and let's go through the literature in brief act which i wouldn't uh, take too much of this as it's it's controversial in its own way but yes the whole story began in around uh, when the literature start to coming around in 2005 where medical therapy to facilitate urinary stone passage has been 
a very commonly advocated thing. And there have been enough studies and meta-analysis in various journals from various centers across the world. And yes, it has been well established and told that it is a modality of treatment we are supposed to consider. Alpha antagonists and calcium channel blockers are drugs of choice where you have excellent results. You should go out and 65% chances that the stone passes out. And the number needed to treat is around four. It's around 3.3 for alpha antagonists and approximately 3.8 for calcium channel blockers. That would say around four. Adverse effects, alpha antagonists were much better off when you compare it to calcium channel blockers. Having said that, there has been equal amount of literature saying about corticosteroids when used along with tamsulosin has got a very good result. Say, for example, if you use tamsulosin alone, it's around 60% according to this paper from Italy. And if you use it in combination with corticosteroids, it shoots up as high as 84.5%. So there comes literature which supports combination therapy of tamsulosin with corticosteroids. Now I've put a small heading here saying contradicting data that comes around 2009s and 10s. All the papers started talking about, is there a role at all for an alpha blocker, say for example, tamsulosin in this paper for dislutric stones of seven millimeters or less. So what does the paper say? It does not improve the stone expulsion rate. So suddenly you have data which says that whether you give an alpha blocker or not, the chances of a dislutic stone, which is smaller than seven millimeters, has got an equal chance of it passing by. But as much as we say this, the drugs, the ideal drug for an MET has started to float around in the literature from tamsulosins to psilocin's and doxazosin. There have been various many papers. So let us look at them in brief again. Now, alphazosin for stone expulsive therapy, this paper from Manoj Monga and his uh, uh, colleagues says that, yes, it's a brilliant drug. You should go ahead and use it. There is no harm in doing it. But the whole thing, as far as drug choice is concerned, took its own twist. With this uh, research paper from the Japanese saying that examination of alpha-1 adenoreceptor subtypes in human ureter, wherein they picked up alpha-1D, is one of the most densely seen receptors in the ureter next to alpha-1. So obviously now we started shooting drugs which are more selective to alpha-1D, and there comes in naftopidil. And once that comes in, we automatically start to compare it with the alpha-1A, that's your naftopidil, along with tamsulosin. And what did the literature at that point of say, period says? It's naftopidil. The choice goes to naftopidil. It says that this is, if not on the same lines, slightly better than tamsulosin. And then comes another drug of choice, psilocin, is a selective alpha-1 subtype uh, adrenergic receptor blocker used in expulsive therapy for stones. And now you have selective uh, blockers in comparison now. Psilocin provides a better stone passage. And next comes literature which compares naftopidil, which is alpha 1D selective, and this comes to alpha 1A. And it's more or less on the same lines. They say there's no significant differences, but noted in stone expulsion rates when you compare these two. So I'll call it a draw. It's a draw now. And like I mentioned, let us see where these alpha blockers have got a role to play in pediatric age group. And this is a paper which comes out from our uh, professor here from Kemal and his uh, associates. And they have compared about how we use in different age groups in, in pediatric age groups. And if you look at carefully, the stone size, which is less than five millimeters, it's bang on. The stones have been passing off. And the expulsion rates, as far as age criteria is concerned, the younger the child, the more chances of the stones passing out rather than compared to a child who is more than seven years old. That's an important observation made in this paper. So bottom line, you can use alpha blockers in kids and quite safely, you need to indicate them properly. And if there has been enough literature, this from Egypt, which compares tamsulosin for management of dislutic stones in children. And it's concluded obviously saying that it's a successful treatment modality, you can safely go ahead and use it. There's another paper which comes out as a review and meta-analysis with a quite sizable number of kids that have been evaluated. And yes, it increases the odds of spontaneous stone passage. That's the conclusion from them. Yes, it can be used. And now we come to pregnancy as such. Another a tricky group of individuals where you want to use an alpha blocker. And this is a paper where they've evaluated more than 207 women uh, and then a short-term utilization of tamsulosin in second and third trimester of pregnancy is not associated with any maternal or infant outcome. So they say it is relatively safe, but however, the point of interest here is there is no significant adjunct for the rate of stone passage. So it doesn't matter whether you use it or not, the stone passage rate is more or less the same. But if you have to look at some predictors as to what would give you a prediction that this particular individual might pass off a stone, there have been some 
interesting papers that have come down. One of such papers is from Lee and his associates who say that longitudinal stone diameter is the parameter which you could look for, for which can predict whether this stone might pass off or not. Uh, this is one interesting uh, paper. And the second one being about a C-reactive protein. It's quite interesting if you have to see this. And they say that the patients where the CRP is more than 21.9 milligrams per liter, they have a low stone expulsion rate. So these are the two predictors uh, uh, based papers that are available. And of course, MET as an auxiliary procedure, it's very well used, especially following S, uh, SWL and URSL and PCNL in some cases. And of course, this paper again from sites at all, I'm quoting it again, has uh, very well been uh, established that renal stones after an ESWL also seem to profit from a medical expulsive therapy, which is of course being used with uh, quite a few centers. And yes, alpha blockers to assist in case of uh, a post lithotripty scenario and tamsulosin being used. If there's enough literature, I wouldn't want to uh, take you through all these lines. And yes, bottom line is it has got a role in these things. Now, let, uh, in short, I'll just see what the guidelines say. One slide per uh, guideline. What does the EAU say? Offer alpha blockers as medical expensive therapy as one of the treatment options for urethral stones more than or equal to five millimeters. Mark my words, it's more than or equal to five millimeters. Means to say less than five millimeters, you don't bother using a alpha blocker. That's what your EAU guidelines say for this. And if you come to the American Neurological Association and Endo Urological Society, who's come out of joint guidelines, it says distal urethric stones less than 10 millimeters. They didn't define what is the smaller ones. Is less than 10 millimeters, go ahead, you can still use a alpha blocker. If you come to the subsections part, in pediatric patients with uncomplicated stones less than 10 millimeters, they say, yes, you can go and use it. Offer observation, yes, that's one of the uh, treatment modalities in children. In pregnant patients with irritable stones, well-controlled well symptoms, clinicians should offer observation as a first-line therapy. This is what AU guidelines and uh, say. Let us come to the NICE guidelines. What do they say? Something on similar lines of AUA. You can consider alpha blockers for adults, children, and young people for dyslurotic stones of less than 10 millimeters again. So it's more or less on the same lines. Alpha blockers could be offered as an adjunctive therapy for adults having SWL for urotic stones less than 10 millimeters again. That's the volume of the stone that you're dealing with in SWL and add it on with an alpha blocker. And I was asked to compare it with what is it that the practice is happening. That's one of the trickiest part to pick up as to what exactly the practice is all about. But I, I, I found a paper which has come out from Cleveland and uh, which, which actually denotes on the current use of medical expulsive therapy among the endourologists. It's quite interesting. The index patient given to them is a patient presenting with an urotric calculus less than 10 millimeters, adequately controlled pain and without fever. And what is, what is it that the urologists have chosen? Look at that, 76% of them, if you have to include the observation part, around 88% of them are, are fine with using an expulsive therapy and surprisingly, the urologist whose experience is less than 10 years has got more chance of using an MAT. The more seniors they are, I guess they're more radical they're turning out to be. But however, and if you ask them as to how aware of uh, literature are they when, when, when you question them about the suspend trial as a, one of the uh, studies, landmark studies about it, quite a few, it's significantly like close to 90% of them are aware of the literature. And uh, how, the mean length of MET is around 22.9 days. That's the duration of uh, expulsive therapy they're uh, ready to give. And if you go further deep into the paper, you see, uh, now here is what I would like to highlight on the controversial part of it. In spite of the guidelines, which we've gone through just now about how dyslytic stones behave well in MET and the size of the stones, look at this. There are 44% to 60% of the urologists ready to use MET even in proximal and middle stones, uretric stones. In contrary, according to the EAU guidelines, don't bother giving if it is less than five millimeters. 75% of us are still willing to give an alpha blocker. So whatever the guidelines say, whatever your literature says, there is a certain pattern, I guess, in the practicing urologists who decide which patients require uh, MET and which patient doesn't require. Now that's a tricky part to pick up. As much as we say about this, look at the uh, other part of it. 83% of them recommend that they need more research on MET. I guess there's enough literature as it is to confuse us. And they recommend that there is more education at the emergency department level that the MET should be more often used. So this gives you an insight of how well the urologist knows about the literature, but how he puts it into his practice. There's some gap in there. I guess the seniors here in this forum will be able to highlight us later in the discussion part. 
But if this paper concludes this way, that MET continues to be a preferred initial approach among the endourologists for patients less than 10 millimeters, perfect. While the current AUA practice guidelines are followed by majority of the respondents, it's notable that our survey suggests MET is being used more liberally than the criteria was established. So that says both. So it doesn't matter what your guidelines say, the practitioners are quite liberal in using it. If I have to put this in a nutshell, it's controversial purely because of high quality contradictory data. There's equally high quality of studies which says yes and it says maybe, and a reasonable treatment of choice to, for a select group of patients, it is definitely is. And the previous data still suggests that significant success is possible with MET. Alpha blockers are better than calcium channel blockers. I guess there's no debate much on that. And MET is definitely as an option as an auxiliary procedure. And there's definitely a bit of a mismatch between guidelines versus practice. I'm, I'm sticking my tongue out to say this. And MET still has a role to play in carefully selected patients and counsel well patients. So I hope I have put across the point question to me by Dr. Jishin. And yes, uh, thanks for this opportunity, Jishin, again. Thank you.